Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Think you can handle it? Welcome to April 1982. We last played two of the best games of the year, Dig Dug in J Japanese arcades and Pitfall at Home. Let's see where we're going now and what else April holds. We're now on the Apple II and this is Bug Battle. Let's take a look at Bug Battle starting with the box. Bug Battle. This is all about maybe Centipede that's throwing all these our way because uh, a lot of these fixed shooters now are have shooting bugs all over the place. And we've already played, I'm pretty sure, 10 games that begin with bugs or shooting bugs. So here, Bug Battle. This is by United Software of America. 2250 with color and sound. Okay. Bugs. Tiny crawling pests have infested your prize winning garden. They've already devoured the tomatoes and are now headed for the main course. Your carrots, peppers, and lettuce. Oh no. To ensure the complete destruction of you, of you and your garden, the jealous neighbor next door is seeding your garden with deadly Amazon scram weed to camouflage the release of lethal blue widow spiders and giant flesh-eating caterpillars. Oh yeah, definitely taking homage from caterpillar uh, or centipede out there. And then we have uh, these 48k for this one. It's been used most of the time for 48k to play these. Here's our instructions. After we boot it into DOS, hit uh, okay. It looks like four players max that can be on this one. Paddle joystick. If you got them, and then it looks like, oh, it uses both paddle and joystick or keyboard if you want to with some special keys. Let's see if there's any commands. Don't even need them. Yeah, this is arcade all the way on the Apple II. Very excited for that. We like the arcade games that we can play on our home computer. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk. Looks the huge. No manual. We had the instructions back there inside the sleeve. Let's pop in and play Bug Battle. It's April 21st, 1982. What is Bug Battle like? And how good of a centipede variant is it? Oh, nice. So this is by Mike Rydell. Way to go, Mike. United Software of America. Opening up like it's a movie. That's pretty cool. And we got the point values for everything. Gotta know the points in the 80s. Otherwise, what's the point of playing, right? I'm gonna hit enter and we can do up to four players, but everything is alternating play, so it really doesn't matter. We'll go one player. And we're in, flashing the one player on the left. All right, let's go. Joystick is in. Oh yeah, there we go. Now the paddle control, you'd expect it to be something similar to the trackball on the arcade, but no, since the paddle only swivels left and right, you're really not getting this, the, the same fidelity that you would in the arcades, but it seems like it would feel the same, or at least it looks the same. It is not. I'm actually playing with joystick and a joystick still works really, really well giving us the same freedom, even almost the same look and similar resolution that Caterpillar had. That small mass of pixels down the bottom of the screen is who we are. And then we, oh, it doesn't respond. Oh, it does, okay. I, I was gonna say, I have to push the keyboard again to play the next life. And then we have a, a random running person. I guess that's the gardener that's trying to distract us running across the screen, adding another flare to Centipede. But this is bug battle, totally different. I really want to kill that guy now. And the spider keeps getting me every time. He's more obnoxious in this one, I'd say, than the arcade version. Game over, player one. I'm pretty sure this is all the screen we got, but the way this plays and how well it plays like a centipede variant is amazing. Anything else? Player one? Okay, yeah, we're in. Get that guy. So he's just dropping down. Yeah, man, it's because I don't think the spider goes as far as it does in the arcades. We aren't super fresh playing Centipede, but you can see as soon as I kill the spider, the second one pops up immediately. Having the control difference between keyboard, joystick, and paddles is a, a very nice touch. Whatever you got plugged in is going to work. And it does the same as before. It's one single shot each. And you can just hold the button down. I finally figured that part out. And it's going to continue to fire over and over and over again. Yeah, it's that randomness of the spider. It is, I think, more random than the arcade. There wasn't a difficulty setting either. It's just go. Okay, I finished all the snake off. And I was expecting a color change like the arcade, but it didn't do that for us. This is still a really excellent centipede variant. Of all the ones we played on the home computer, this is one of the best ones. And don't even get me started on consoles. Usually the home computer is going to be pushing arcade games before the consoles do, making them look closer to the arcade. This is still the age of, let's make the game look as close to the arcade as possible and it's going to sell more.
So there you go. That is Bug Battle. I'd say uh, definitely an above average game for all the games you could play up to this point. I don't know if I can go all the way to saying four stars because, um, let me see. Well, it is four players, but it is alternating play. I'll still go three and a half. It's a, a very well done uh, port at home of Centipede that you could check out. And let's continue playing every single game. What's our next one? We're still on the Apple II, and this is Card Stars, Cribbage, and Solitaire. Let's play some card games on our Apple II. Taking a look at the box first. This is Cribbage and Solitaire. Not super familiar with Cribbage. Five of Card Masters best games. We got Klondike on here. Two versions. Picture Frame, Super Challenging Pyramid. Card games were never so terrific before. At least that's what they say on the box. How excited are you about card games? All right, let's pop in and play some Card Stars, Cribbage and Solitude. Still April 21st, 1982. This is by Datamost, developed by Art Carpet. Way to go, Art. And I'm pretty sure we're not using joystick for cards, but we'll see what happens. Really cool opening. Nice high res picture for the, the front there. Okay, so we got Klondike, Klondike variants, picture frame, and pyramid. I'm kind of familiar with Klondike, so let's go with that one. We'll push A. Do we want automatic flipping? Yes. Yes, we do. There we go. Art carpet. Let's see what you got. Can't really rate, rate this on other card games because it's pretty much all the, closer to the, the same. You can see how they uh, had to fill up a lot of the screen real estate with cards, but I mean, it's a, a card game. All right, so it says play. What are, what are we playing, though? Let's see. We got, okay, we got the stack. I got I guess I do I. Okay, it flips over the card, I see. And then this is what's readjusting to play solitaire. So most likely then uh, three, two, can't do it going down. Two's already at the end. Do we have an ace? We can do E. Yeah, drop the ace down. Okay, I, I understand. And then we go to there. Let's flip it over again. So you got the stack, which is I. You flip over it onto J, and you're, you're essentially just using the keyboard, and you just put in the letters that you want to use. So right now we got a 10. No place to put the 10. We do have a 2 of diamonds, so I could put this 2 down in the stack. 2 over there on top of the ace. Flips over. We got the queen. Yeah, so it's, it's solitaire. And the way they have it, so everything's in columns with letters associating, it, it actually works because it's it's better than some of the other ones we've seen where you type in J for the type of card or the number. It's a little bit easier to work with. Okay, so let's see. Uh, got the ace there. Let's move the J, uh, ace over. And now we have the 10. Still can't do anything with that. And yeah, you can rearrange. Like, I think I can do D to F. Yeah, there you go. And you can see it's... The same idea with with the way Solitaire is played. All right, so I'd say pretty good for the time. Like the idea of switching it up, putting letters in, so you just have to type the letter to check it out. So, I uh, really, how much do you want to play a card game? So, if, if if you think of all the genres we deal with on the channel, we're playing every single video game. This is this is cards. I mean, how do you compare this to an arcade game? How do you compare it to a strategy game? But uh, I'd still say a very well done card game for the time. I'm going to say three stars, perfectly average for what you'd expect to play or check out in 1982. It's kind of hard to say that, though. There's so many different genres and uh, types of games that are happening right now. Developers going nuts with whatever they, whatever they can throw out there. Just let's see if it sticks. So uh, you never know. All right. So after Card Stars, let's see our next game. Oh, also released at the same time. This is Computer Gin Rummy for the Apple II. Another card game. For all those card game enthusiasts in the 80s. Let's take a look at the box for Computer Gin Rummy. Very bizarre, data most. Same publisher, same developer as uh, the last game, uh, Solitaire. But uh, what are they doing with the front of the box? This is Gin Rummy in the future, playing against a robot, I guess, right? Very bizarre. Or a trash can. Makes other card games seem dull and boring. Plays a really professional level game. It's always ready to take you on day or night. Enjoy the greatest gin rum you've ever played because gin rum you have to have other people to play. So the computer would be ideal for that one. And there's our five and a quarter floppy disk. Art carpets at it again, giving us a high quality game. <laughs> I guess that's another variation of what's the future like if you're in 1982 and you're looking ahead. All right, let's pop in and play some computer gin rummy. It's April 21st, 1982. This is by Datamost. All right, looks really similar to what we played before. Let's play some gin. And they have two other ones, knock and one mill. Not familiar with those. So push in number one. Oh, okay, so it selects from there. I deal to two, and uh, okay, it looks like the computer's going to go first. 
So deals them all out. There's the cards I can see. Computer's cards are face down, can't see them. Let's see, okay, now it's our, our turn up. You can discard deck. Uh, cards are a little bit larger than they were before, but same idea, whenever you want to select a card, you don't type Q for queen or K for king. You just type in whatever the letters below it, uh, which may take a little bit of getting used to, because let's say I want to switch out like F. Oh, I got to see, wait, uh, deck. And then I can uh, winner and then discard F. There we go. If you ever play Jin, yeah, this is like finishing the game. We're totally losing because Apple beat us by 25 points. Because this said, let's show us the end of the end of the game. We're not going to do an entire game of Gin Rummy here, but there you go. That's what it's kind of like to play computer Gin Rummy in 1982. At least this version on the Apple II. I'm still going to say about three stars average for the time. Um, just because for card games, it's actually pretty good for uh, card games for the time. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're still on the Apple II. This is Dragon's Keep. You can't put the Apple II down. Let's take a look at Dragon's Keep, starting with the box. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Speaking of bizarre front of the boxes, here's Dragon's Keep. It's a high-res learning game. This is meant to be an adventure game for ages 7 and up. With all the adventure games we played, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty sure we can handle a kid's adventure game in 1982. And this is by Sierra Online, created by Al Lowe, Ma Margaret Lowe, Michael McChesney, Ray Lynn McChesney. And this is the first box, I believe it was picked up by Breadhill or whatever the company was that uh, Al Lowe was in before Sierra did it. So this is the l slightly later release of Dragon's Keep. Yeah, flip it over in the back and you can see it's captivating adventures into dragon territory to rescue 16 animals. High res adventure. I'm very surprised we see all these children's games made by Al Lowe when everyone knows what's going to happen later. Yeah, graphics made with Penguin software. Yeah, I, I'm with you. All right, so here we go. What other artwork we got for Dragon's Keep? Oh, there we go. So we got two different ones, the Sierra Online and then just Sierra. Junior Adventure Game. There we go. We flip it over in the back and you got some examples of screenshots. What does it focus on and teach the kids? Wait, so is it educational? Maybe they're trying to advertise it as educational. If it's educational, we need to step away. And there's the five and a quarter floppy disk for the Dragon's Keep. It actually sounds legit. It doesn't sound like we're going to play a children's game. All right, let's pop it and play Dragon's Keep. It's April 21st, 1982. Playing every single video game, including Sierra's educational games by Al Lowe. Yes, Sierra Online Incorporated presents... And it wasn't just Al Lowe. I just want to give Al Lowe credit because he's more popular for Leisure Suit Larry. All right, so here we go. Press any key to continue. Have you played this game before? That's kind of an homage to King's Quest when it says, have you previously played King's Quest V? I'm going to say, no, we have not. We have not played this game, and they're going to teach us how to play. we got to pretend like we're seven years old. I have no idea how a seven-year-old would wait this long. Oh, okay, now, now we're back. First, press the space bar. Okay, so spacebar lets us select options, got it, and then press return to pick your choice. So I can hit return, turn the screen green, got it, turn it black, and then see a surprise. Ooh, Penguin graphics on the Apple II. It's like we played a demo. Would you like more practice? No, no, we don't. <laughs> that was all the practice. Animals are trapped in the house by a magic dragon. You should let all of the animals go. You can't let an animal go if the dragon is in the same picture as the animal. To make the dragon go away, you have to make the picture change. During the game, to see a list of the animals that are free, press F. During the game, you can turn the sound on and off by pressing S or hold while holding down control. There's all the animals we gotta get. That almost sounds like a logic puzzle. You're now ready to play Dragon's Keep. Animation created with the okay, penguin software, blah, 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 I got it. Programmed by Allo. There we go. Text and graphics by all, everyone else. Thanks so much, everyone, for bringing us this children's adventure game. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if uh, people knew Al Lowe as an adventure or an educational developer first, and then they pick up Leisure Suit Larry like, it's another game for by Al Lowe. We should get it for little Timmy. He'll love it. He loved all the other ones. So again, how is a seven-year-old going to wait this long? I, I, I don't understand. Maybe in 1982 they had more patience. Because this is r r real time. We're on an Apple IIe, so it's even a little slightly overpowered. Uh, than what you would have seen in 1982. We're still waiting for the load, though. Th this is a live load. The seven-year-old by this point is running outside and playing, which they should be doing. They do have some nice graphics, though, while we wait. High-res Dragon's Keep. All right, there we go. 
Maybe I just didn't hit spacebar. You're in front of the house. Now, this one is an adventure game that all I got to do is hit spacebar to make the selections. It's a multiple choice adventure game. Very first one. No text parser. The text is already in there for you. So let's go in the house and hit enter. That's why it's made for the seven and up. You don't have to type. You, you just hit spacebar and enter. Oh no, the dragon's here. What do I do? You're in front of the house. Move the magic basket. Look behind the chair. It goes so slow, though. I do enjoy that we don't have to type everything in, but uh, we still have to wait for the loading. Oh, the poor dog's tied up. All right, so we get to pick up a knife in the game. Kids, pick up knives around the house. Let's say cut the rope, pet the dog. Yeah, let's cut that rope. Dog wags his tail, runs away. Keep up the good work. We are teaching children to pick up knives around the house, the seven-year-olds. Dog wags his tail, runs away, and hit return. You're still 15 more animals to help. Got it. Return to the front room. Okay, so yeah, it is a very simple adventure game for kids. All right, so Dragon's not here. That's good. We'll go to the library on the right. It would help people understand or kids understand how to play an adventure game. So I applaud them. Yeah, the loading, though, I don't know how the kids could handle that. <laughs> My child learned how to use a knife from Al Lowe. All right, let's go to the room. On, oh, take a book and read it. Read one of the books, yes. The hen is at the... Oh, the dragon interrupted. We couldn't read it fast enough. If you are a fast enough reader, then you can know where the hen is at the train station. <laughs> I'm not sure either. Oh, my gosh. Okay, let's uh, a little taste. We won't do any more of that. You kind of get the idea of how Dragon's Keep runs. Now, this one's kind of curious because I kind of like the multiple choice. It's very easy. Uh, I don't know how long I could take it. That's obviously made for kids. But for all the games we played up to this point, that's pretty impressive that, um, that, that, that kids would be into something and be able to play something this easy. Loading time, though, ugh, I don't know. I'm still going to say, of all the games we've seen up to this point, I'll just say three stars. It is a, a perfectly average title. The only thing would be just the age range it's meant, it's meant for and the how long it takes for moving from screen to screen. All right, so with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're still on the Apple II. It's an Apple II night. And this is Exit. Let's take a look at Exit and see what it's all about, starting with the box. Exit. Another one by Gabelli Software. That is a front of a cover. Whoa, it is definitely an egg on there. Something's popping out of the egg. Is it a pickle? I don't know. Is it a green tongue? The aliens, though, are something unique. They look like something from uh, Daft Punk or the Gray Man Group. That is freaky. I dig it. And that's pretty much all we get. Uh, it's the front of the front of the box for exit. <laughs> Yes, the night of messed up box art. I love it. All right, we also got a manual for this one. Oh, even better. High quality? Yes. It's a snake inside the egg. That's what I'm talking about. Dude, what is up with that? So we got creatures being carried away, and I, uh, I, I'm i flipping out. I mean, the, the sunglasses are something hip, too, for the 80s. So this is by Nasir Gabelli, not just published by Gabelli Software. Illustrated by John Tesla. Where to go, Nasir and John? So as the protector of Earth's inhabitants, you must stretch your endurance to the outermost limit. You alone can destroy the bizarre life forms emerging from an alien asteroid and threatening our planet. Kind of like space invaders. This strange metallic invader from the galaxy, Zarkob, appeared suddenly and mysteriously began its close, dangerous orbit around the Earth. Did Nasir write this? I know he's known for programming, but did he have to write the story or did he get someone else to do the lore for Exit? Tolgers from the asteroid are advancing rapidly. Each one that escapes your projectiles will exit up the conveyors to the incubators, where hatching releases any one of eight creatures. These creatures must be destroyed. They mature it, it, As they mature, they gain strength and point value. When they reach their adult stage, the Vulcan Flyer appears. They must be destroyed before he snatches the creature and transports it to the Earth for the ultimate destruction. Beware when you reach the cheating level. What? The cheating level? So it looks like levels one through eight? The shoot bell. Okay, escape is pause. That's interesting. That's the same as whenever we play on the Atari home computer. So controls are just uh, fire up. A and Z is to fire up and down. And there's our point value. He's got to have that in the 80s. How many points are all these things? What's the point? Unless you got points. All right, so that is how we play. Let's pop in and play and check out Exit 
It's April 22nd, 1982. Let's see what Nasir's cooked up for us now. I'm expecting something graphically amazing. I am not familiar with Exit, but the front of the box has me hooked. Yes, right? <laughs> Broken by the jerk. Thanks, the jerk. Thanks, jerk, for bringing us Exit. Okay, we're in. No joystick. Uh-oh, 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 no joystick. So it is only left and right. We already got aliens making eggs. Oh, I died. Oh. <laughs> no way. They bring out an ambulance to pick me up. So I came out of the pod. Ambulance comes, picks me up, and drives off. That's just like in Crazy Critters. They got animation for the transition. That's so cool. So I go inside again, and I have my low shot, which shoots all the aliens down there. And then at the top, those are the aliens that hatched into eggs. And I got to shoot up to get them. Oh, no, here comes another one. Oh, another one got on the conveyor belt. So you have to be simultaneously worrying about what's on top and at the bottom. And whenever I do shoot an, uh, an alien at the top, look at the bullets. They come down again. I wonder if they hurt me. Let's see. Let's shoot them up and then land on me again. <laughs> they do. So when you fire up, the bullets come down and then land back on the ship and you die and lose a, lose a man. That's awesome. But, I mean, look at what we're seeing. Watch the scaling. It's another thing that N Nasir's doing something funky with the Apple II to make you feel like you're being traveled, traveling back or farther away. i got to watch out for those shots I do down low. Okay, let's pop, pop them up high, then get out of the way. Okay, yeah, great. We haven't seen this before. We, we, we've seen games change with the firepower, like doing in Scramble, where you got bullets that fire forward and then the bombs come down. But now we got another one. We can fire in the distance or fire up like Space Invaders, but the bullets come down. So it's another space game, but it's just done completely different and fresh. And you can see the, the way that we're going in the distance. But here's the one gripe, though. Where's all the sound? We already know the Apple II isn't very good on sound, but I hear nothing. There are no shots there's nothing happening in the game and I'm wondering if that's either the disc or the way the game's running it's silence did I die or make sound whenever I died let's see no still nothing it's like the, the, the game's on mute I really hope it's just a copy of the game there's no way they would have programmed this with nothing because the, even the Apple II on space games we hear a little blip and bloop really, really tiny one it's not the best sound for Apple II but oh my gosh <laughs> everybody pop your acid in 1982 and play some Exit. Yeah, this is wild. All right, so that is an exceptional game uh, for the time. Yeah, right? So I... <laughs> yeah, the game's so amazing, we can see it instead of hear the sound. I'm going to just assume that there's something wrong with the disc or something wrong with the emulation. There, there had to have been some kind of sound. But I'm still going to say Exit is... Um, so fresh, uh, it's some fresh exit. We're gonna we're gonna say four stars for exit of all the games you could play up to this point. It is is wild and wacky, but uh, it, it's it, it's a pretty good game. Not one of the best ones you could play, but it's it's up there as a very good one. All right, so after all of that, now we're gonna get, check out something even crazier. It's time for the launch of the ZX Spectrum. That's right, we're going to the United Kingdom. The big, amazing system. If you look over here on the far left side, this ad is technically from 1984 when they upgraded the ZX Spectrum, but I love the sound of the ad. I love the conveyor belt of the original Spectrums going in, and so this one is like l letting you know we are launching. The ZX Spectrum is out there, and this is more than just your upgrade of the ZX81. The ZX Spectrum, if you're into the specs of the system, just to compare to everything else we got out there, it, it comes inside the CPU, the Z80A, or the ZZ80A, running at 3.5 megahertz. And to put in perspective, the BBC Micro is running at 4 megahertz, but still much more overpowered compared to the ZX81, because that one was running at 1, mega, 1 megahertz inside. And if you're on the Timex Sinclair 1000, the North American one, that's 2 megahertz, so still an upgrade, upgrade there. As far as memory, this is 16K. And later on, they're going to have upgrade it to 48K. And then at the end, when it's like the ZX, Spe uh, ZX Spectrum Plus, it turns into 128K. And the video is the PAL RF display runs at 256 by 192 at 15 colors. The sound inside is a beeper, a one channel beeper. Later on in the 128K version, we'll have the three channel AY chip. And then this runs mostly cassette tapes. So there you go. That's all the info about the ZX Spectrum. 
this is not just the upgrade adding sound and color to the ZX81, but uh, it's a little bit more than that. And now, are you ready to join me on the what the games came out or you could play when the ZX Spectrum was launched? Very rarely do we can, can we play games right when a computer is launched. But we can't now, because some of these games you were able to play on the ZX81 and you're able to play them on the, the ZX Spectrum. So here we go, this is Adventure 1 which is another trend when a home computer is released, we got to put a text adventure out there. So here we go. Let's check out adventure one for the ZX Spectrum. Very apropos for everything else we played. Let's take a look at the box. This is the cassette box for adventure one. <laughs> Definitely hand drawn reminds me of all the other home computer games we played. And it says a Dungeons and Dragons textual adventure it makes it sound role playing, but no, it is not. Adventure 1 is re-released later a few times, one by Melbourne House, and then another time where it's essentially going to be the same game, but this is the very first time it was released. We have... Oh, we don't have the manual. We have some text information inside. Oh, that's right, with the huge schnoz, yeah! <laughs> All right, we have lots of alternate versions. Here we go, first time playing the ZX Spectrum. Let's pop in the cassette tape and play. It's April 23rd, 1982. This is by Abersoft. Adventure number one. Now, adventure number one is essentially just another colossal cave adventure. So uh, for all the text adventure fans out there, we're probably going to be playing this over and over and over again on the channel. There's so many colossal cave ripoffs. And this is another one. It's almost like this when we play the Star Trek games, the strategy games. We're going to be playing Star Trek games probably all through the 80s. So this is adventure. It's it's it bare bones, exactly like Colossal Cave. You're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building and down a gully. Let's go east. And look at the color. Ooh, we finally get some color. You're inside of a building, a well house for a large spring. About you can be seen the keys. Oh, get those keys. Get the lamp. Oh yeah, feel that chiclet keyboard. Man, the sponginess is so cool. Just pretend you don't hear the clicks in the background. Let's get the food. Oh, no, food. And get the water. Got it all. Nice. Okay, so let's go west. <laughs> You're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building around you is a forest. Stream flows out of the... Okay, blah, blah, we're already there. Let's go north. You're in the open forest with a deep valley to one side. And east. You're in a valley in the forest beside a stream tumbling along a rocky bed. Let's go south. At your feet, all the water of the stream splashes into a two-inch slit in the rock. Downstream, the stream bed is bare rock. And now we're in a 20-foot depression floor with bare dirt. Set into the dirt is a strong steel grate mounted in concrete. A dry stream, stream bed leads into the depression. About you can be seen the grate that is locked. So if this all looks familiar, it's because we played already 10, 20, maybe even Colossal Cave variants or Adventure variants. Because the very first one was just called Adventure and then Colossal Cave also came out after that. But th this is essentially what it is. Uh, let's unlock that grate. Let's get in there and go down. You're in a th small chamber beneath a 3x3 three three steel grate to the surface. A low crawl over cobbles lead inward to the west. And we can see the grate is now open. I'm going to be playing this so much that I probably won't need the walkthrough anymore. So I, I looked up another walkthrough for this adventure game. And it's pretty much the same as the Colossal Cave. So if I play this enough, I think I'm just going to be, have it memorized of where to go and what to do in this one. But you get the idea. This is one of the first games you could check out on the ZX Spectrum. So for Adventure 1... Oh, I'm going to say for all the home computers we can see at the time, it's really not super impressive, um, considering, uh, but it is slightly in color. I'm going to say two and a half stars. It is subpar considering everything else you could play at the time, but that's not all. Are you ready to enter the wild and wacky world of the games you could play on the ZX Spectrum? Here we go. Our next game is... The Black Dwarf's Lair is our next one. Let's take a look at the Black Dwarf's Lair. Another one that has the homebrew of all homebrew front of the cassette case. Look at that. Black Dwarf's Lair. I can't even tell. Is it, Oh, it's Newsoft. That's right. Uh, is the pu publisher. I don't know if they call it a publisher. It's one person, probably, that did the publishing. Yeah, that's it. That's all we get for the front of the box. 
And for other versions, we just have alternate ones and a few tools to change up. Let's pop in the cassette tape and play The Black Dwarf's Lair. It's April 23rd, 1982, the launch of the ZX Spectrum by Newsoft Products. Oh, really? It's not? Right now, whenever I talk? I hope not. It's coming through from my side, but I hope it's uh, hopefully it's coming through the right way. Your mission is to trap the Black Dwarf and return the magic chalice. To aid you in your task, you have a staff with 500 units of magic. Use it to overcome the hazards hidden in the dot 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 Black Dwarf's lair. Press any key. Interesting. So wait, we have a we have to trap the Black Dwarf, return the magic chalice. We have a staff with magic. Wait, so is this is this role play? Is this not text adventure game? To aid you in your quest, you may use magic to lock an empty chamber or to SCRY the contents of adjacent chambers. What was what would SCRY mean? <gasps> Weird sound. Our first beep on the ZX Spectrum. Warning, I can hear money rattling. Tunnels lead to 30, 33, 36, 39. You're currently in chamber 42. Wait a second. That, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, SCRY, I don't know what that means. Maybe scry? Scare? Scary? Scary away? All right, so we can move. Let's move. Hitting M. Oh, yes. Use that beeper. <laughs> Which chamber do you want to move to? We're going to 39. Because, you know, why not? They give us a little color and animation. Tunnels uh, lead to 13 and 42. We're currently in 39. Now we can lock, move, or SCR. Okay, let's, let's move to lucky number 13 room lucky number 13 one three so cool hearing the beeper of the zedic spectrum for the first time i can hear a dragon tunnels lead to oh we got a lot of different places okay so we're currently in the lucky number 13 so let's try the scry uh so s and then it's going to say what do we want to scry Move or... Yeah, what what chamber do we want to use our magic on? Let's try chamber 40. Go, magic! Aw, oh, chamber's empty. You use 24 units. So it's not really a role-playing game. It actually feels more like we're playing a, a Wumpus game. A text-only version of Wumpus. But instead of fighting Wumpus, we're looking for a dwarf. And there is other enemies in the room to t take care of. Because we're going room by room... Okay, yeah, so let's go... I don't know what lock means, but let's go move. Which chamber do we want to move to? Let's go to 38. Yeah, so we're moving around room to room, and it's giving us hints of what's next. Maybe the dragon's in here. Let's see. Okay, no no, no dragon in this one. And you make your way moving around, but they did give us, like, a, a an item, a staff in the beginning. There you go. So that is another quick taste of the Black Dwarf's Lair. I'd say of all the games we've seen to this point, that one's okay uh, for uh, I, uh, one of the first games to play on the ZX Spectrum. If we consider everything we've seen up to this point as far as home computers, it's about average. But for the ZX Spectrum, uh, this is awesome. This would be really fun to play. I want to say three stars for The Black Dwarf's Lair of all of the games we can play up to this point. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Session, British computing was a miraculous exception. A manufacturing industry that wasn't sacking everyone. If it's got a keyboard, a manual and computer written on it, it'll sell. That's the word around the exploding market for personal or home computers that simply plug into a television set. We're the world's largest producer of computers. We make more than the whole nation of town put together. Technological innovation had met 80s entrepreneurialism. The perfect mix for a leader who was a science graduate as well as a free market evangelist. So our minister, this is a small there you go. Get Margaret Thatcher computer. Herself. <laughs> Margaret Thatcher messing around with her ZX Spectrum. So now we're going to check out some of the ones that were included in compilations. And from what we've seen in Europe as far as compilations go, be afraid. Be very afraid. This is Castle Walls. This is by Phipps Associates, part of a compilation called Pocket Book, Book Games, and we're not going to play every part of the Pocket Book Games. I just made a few selections of ones to check out. So here you go. This is Castle Walls on the ZX Spectrum. It's April 23rd, 1982 by Phipps Associates. 
Here we go. Castle Walls. The Marauding Hordes of Normans have finally reached the Castle Ego. You have a thousand galleons of boiling oil at your disposal. Use it wisely. You can pour the oil into the rising ladders, ladders by using the six key. Okay, number six. Anytime you can obtain more oil by pressing eight. But beware the ladders will keep on rising. What level? Uh, level one, I guess. I don't know. All right, six. Drops the oil. Six. Oh, okay, I get it. It's like it's almost like a bomber variant or a blitz variant because we we're constantly moving. I'm not controlling the guy at the top. But oh my gosh, it is so bad. It's it's so jerky. Quick, drop the oil. And you have to stop the ladder from coming down. So it's a constantly rising ladder. The player at the top is moving back and forth. It's just where I'm just pushing a button at the right time. And oh my gosh, it's so bad. I felt like we had some connection with the text adventure games, but this one, no. No, no, no. Oh, very good. Thanks, Chiptune. All right, there you go. So that's Castle Walls to show you again what other games are available on the ZX Spectrum. I'm going to say uh, that one is yikes. Uh, I'm going to say it's bad. One and a half stars. Oh, man, is it broken? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to say it's broken. One star. One star for Castle Walls. Let's press forward and see our next game. Our next one is Death Valley for the ZX Spectrum. Let's pop in and play some Death Valley. This one's by Usborne Publishing, part of a book called Computer Space Games that you would have typed in to play. It's April 23rd, 1982. Here we go. How wide do we want the Death Valley to be? I don't know, 25? Okay, go. Oh, it's the driving game. You got to move dots on the screen. Oh, we're going to crash if I can fi figure out the... Oh, we crashed into the wall, and the whole game has crashed. Like, literally, the game has crashed. After you crash, the game crashes. <laughs> what? <laughs> that was like... Oh, man. Yeah, this one I could, I, this one would be the borderline rating zero stars, right? The, the only thing is I heard that when you rate zero stars, it doesn't go in the database as any rating at all. It's like rating it as uh, nothing. <laughs> yes, right? It is literally broken because it broke itself. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say zero. Yeah, Death Valley is zero. <laughs> Let's continue playing our next game. Our next one is Desert Tank Battle for the ZX Spectrum. This is another one by Usborne Publishing that you could have typed in from a computer book called Computer Battle Games. Let's type it and play on the ZX Spectrum. April 23rd, 1982. It's by Daniel and Ginny. Way to go, Daniel and Ginny. So this one is Desert Tank Battle. What's the direction? Uh, 40, I guess. What elevation do I want? 45? Missile landed to the right and too far. <gasps> no way. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a text-only artillery game. The games where you shoot bullets back and forth, but you don't even see anything. It just tells you what happens. Wow, throwback to mainframe. The missile. This is kind of the reason I didn't want to do mainframe games back in the 60s and 70s. So the missile landed to the right and too far. Okay, so that means you have to make adjustments and change it up, but then you don't... Yes, oh my gosh, it doesn't show you. It just tells you the text. Oh my goodness. Yes, right? But this is another reason you could play this at launch of the ZX Spectrum because it was type in available on the ZX81 and also the ZX Spectrum. So, uh, I don't know. I'm going to say half star. Well, you know what? No, it, it's actually accomplishing what it needs to do. I'll say one because it, it is doing what it needs to do, but it's just why, why would you want to play a text only artillery variant? Yikes. And our next game is digital puff balls on the ZX Spectrum. If it's digital, does that mean it's going to be in color? This one's part of a type in book called Use and Learn by Micrawl, developed by Graham Asher. Way to go, Graham. April 23rd, 1982. Is it in color? <gasps> All right, we're going to stop our tape and then push a key. Get our chiclet keyboard ready. It's nine digital puff balls have been escaped from the bioengineering laboratory. You must destroy them as quickly as possible. You can run them over if you hit them on the numerical order and without crossing your own tracks. Time is very short. Beware the electric fence. So if you look at the arrow keys, five, six, seven, and eight is how you can control the game. And that's because the keyboard itself, the cursor keys are five, six, seven, and eight. So if you had your hands on the chiclet keyboard, it would make sense. What difficulty level do we want? Uh, I don't know. Two. All right, we're ready to play some digital puff balls, and we're in. So I'm using the chiclet keyboard, pushing down on the keys to maneuver around, and I'm just picking up things, but I can stop. Okay, so it's not like Snake. It's not continuing on. Uh, I can 
sit here as long as I want and then move to the next one. So the countdown is try to get it done as fast as you can. Oh, use the beeper. We heard sound. All right, so this means I don't think I can pick up four or five. Yep, there we go. Got it. Whoa. Video games in 1982 in England, man. Let's pop some more acid. It's really not a snake game because it doesn't constantly move the snake. It's actually a walking around, picking things up game. It's a little bizarre. Okay, so I'd say of all the games you could play at this point for the home computer, it's bad, but it's it's not too bad. Uh, I'm going to say two stars. If you think of all the other games you could play. On the Spectrum, though, this is all right. I'd say average for the Spectrum <laughs> since it just launched. And what's our next game? Our next game is Crack It on the ZX Spectrum. Let's take a look at Crack It. Starting with the box. We have, it's not really a box, it's the cassette tape cartridge. All right, so find the name of the country, city, and number in 12 clues like the this one below. Where it all began, where the torch was first lit, where the muscles and sinews strain, where our heroes win, uh, heroes win acclaim, where the symbols hold the key, win 10,000 pounds and more, and it's, this is both for the Spectrum and the ZX81. This one is a marketing ploy. It's pretty much just a puzzle game where they give you clues like riddles, and if you can solve it, you'll win 10,000 pounds. That's all this is. So it's it's pretty much, you, if you saw this in the store when this came out, you'd be like, oh, I can win 10,000 pounds, and then you buy it because of that reason. That's all it is. That's really all it is. Okay, and we don't really have the actual manual. What do we got? Okay, lots of alternate versions. Let's pop in the cassette tape of Crack It. This is by Arctic Computing. International Publishing and Software are the ones that developed this one. And I wonder how much they sold on it, because here's the dealio. When this game came out and you bought it, you were expected to figure out the riddles, which are very cryptic and very uh, difficult. My only child, this legacy is my gift to you. You know I was an international courier. On this cassette are 12 clues with international answers. If you can solve all 12 clues, you deserve the 10,000 pounds. I put in the bank for you. The longer it stays unclaimed, the larger the amount becomes. No way. All right, so pushing any key to continue. That loving father and his only child have died. The money is still there in a bank somewhere in this world. That money is sitting waiting for the first person who can solve the 12 clues to claim it. And the sum grows larger each week. Will you claim the legacy? Sounds like it's like a rat race. And some people are going to be going for the money. Good luck. So crack it clues. There's 12 clues. Which one do you want to see? Let's see clue number one. Wow. And that's the first clue. A bunch of numbers and the word ring. And then, okay, clue number eight. And that's all this is. This, this game is just a riddle. Okay, there you go. Send plus more over money is the eighth eighth clue. Now, as I go through these clues... Wait, is there any key to continue? Oh, wow, no. It's, it's then giving you a giant rubric to pick from. And then we got clue number nine. By the bare scalp of Robin's Hood Fat Friar, this fellow were a king for our... <gasps> Whoa. Yeah, it's all random clues. So this game... While I'm not going to go through every single clue, Crack It never got solved. Nobody ever won 10,000 pounds. In 1984, the company that released this told the answers to all the clues. You can look it up if you want to see the, the, the answer. But no one turned in all 12 and no one won 10,000 pounds. But did it work? Did they sell a lot of copies? Did people buy it thinking they could win the 10,000 pounds? So I have no idea how to rate this game. It's... Uh, riddles and puzzles, but it's it's bad because it's meant to cash in for people that wanted to try to win. It's like the lottery, I guess. So I'm going to say uh, one star for Crack It. And it was unsuccessful. Nobody figured it out. Nobody got 10,000 pounds. It's too bad. All right, let's see where we're going now. Oh, a brief intermission. We're going to the arcade. After the launch of the ZX Spectrum, here's a Locomotion, released first in Japan as Gatanga Tong which I'm hopefully I'm only going to say once on the channel. Let's take a look at the artwork for Locomotion. This is the name it was called when it was brought to North America, and there it is. In Japan, it was known as that name. Have a nice trip. This is by Konami. When it was in North America, it was ported or brought to us by Century. And then there's an example of the arcade cabinet for Locomotion. Anybody remember playing this one? Oh, and there we go. There's Gatenga Tong, the Japanese... One look at look at the difference. Looks more flashy with the stars on the sides in Japan. I dig it. All right, so there's our arcade control panel. This one is controlling with a joystick. It looks like, and then a shoot button. Okay, yeah. What is it? Oh, it has a speed button. Okay, so four-way joystick 
and then a button for speed. Is that what it said? No. Okay, this is, must be Gatanga Tong. They have shoot for the speed button, I guess. And there you go. There's the arcade marquee for locomotion with some other artwork. There it is in Germany, known as Bimmelbahn or Gatanga Tong, also in Germany. They called it the same as it is in Japan. Okay. What's going to be cooking up here? Let's take a look at the manual. What the heck is locomotion? At least whenever it came to North America, we'll be able to read it. But it was first in Japan, which is where this this launch is. So, Century Gotcha. What do you got here? What is this? There it is. Locomotion is the newest video game produced by Century. To short rendition of I've been working on the railroad. <laughs> okay. The network is composed of connecting squares of different colors, each square containing a different shaped section of train track and one blank square. The train is guided along its destiny to all stations by adjusting the direction of the track. This is accomplished by moving the joystick up, down, right, or left. Accomplished by, and the track can be connected to any one of four blocks surrounding the blank square. The track, tr the train travels over is distinguished by its bright yellow color. By connecting the track to any one of the junction points, known as the bonus lines, a bonus of 150 points is added to the score. The speed of the train is increased by holding down the right or left speed button. Okay, there's two speed buttons. And then dead ends must be avoided. As the train travels through each station picks up passengers, 100 points are added to the game score. For each block of track it crosses to reach stations, 10 points are added. Train must reach bonus station before bonus reaches zero. And trains caught in a loop. Beware of the loop sweeper appearing the and chasing the train to an attempt to destroy it. Whoa. Now, this is a original game concept. For some reason, I feel like we should have seen this game concept already. What other versions? Okay, we got the one in Japan. We have a bootleg version, and then the one we're going to be checking out, which is Locomotion, so we can understand it. But it's April 23rd, 1982. This is developed by Konami and released by Sega in Japan. So this is the horrible love child of Konami and... I already forgot. <laughs> of both Konami and... Um... Why can't I remember what it was? What is it, Locomotion? Oh, Sega just did the publishing. Okay, so Konami did the development. But, I mean, Konami and Sega coming together to make this game? This is bizarre. Let's see if the attract mode has anything for us. It looks like just you're doing a sliding puzzle in the arcades. So you bring things over to the station, get your points. Gotcha. They must have been fishing for something new. And then we have the bonus line. I don't know what that part means, but here we go. That's how you get your bonus points. Have the train travel over that side. Go to the bonus station. Gather up all the points you need. And then, oh, if it gets zero, the crazy train. <laughs> oh, man. Ozzy Osbourne already released Crazy Train, right? Sega! Thanks, Chip2. <laughs> Yeah, a little too late on that one. Adjust the rail line so you let your train advance safely. Okay, yeah, so it's a sliding puzzle game. What? I feel like we've seen this game before, but I, th I think this is the very first time this has happened. I just know there's a lot of other games that try this formula of moving things around like a sliding puzzle while... Yeah, see that? Oh my goodness. All right, let's put a coin in and see what's going to happen when we play Locomotion. All right, we're pushing start. Some more public domain music there for you. All right, we're in. Slide us up. We connect. Pick up the happy faces. So you can see every time I move the four-way joystick, it's just sliding around what is available. Picking up more there. Oh, this is... We're on a good track right now. At least we're starting us off in a good place. And they have a really nice train sound effects. If you didn't know, in Japan, they are all about trains. Like, they are more about trains than we are in North America. Alright, we're going to loop around this side. Oh no, the crazy train! <laughs> oh yeah, we can make it go faster, right? Let's see. That's it. Go, go, go. Yeah, that's it. Crank it up. And then we got to get over to the other side. Oh, I need to loop around this one. There we go. Oh, I missed it. So it's a bizarre idea. It's slash puzzle game. It's, it's very much not like an arcade game. Like the idea of kicks. 
in the arcades. It was uh, it was an, a different idea, and it just seems weird to play something in the arcades because when I go to the arcades in 1982, I'm expecting a space shooter, something action based. But this one, I'm having to think. I don't want to think when I go to the arcades. I want to play some games. Can we get this? Whoa, we cleared the level. I didn't know. I thought we had to pick up the other passengers on the right side. We are a locomotion pro. Oh, I see. Yeah, pushing the smash, smashing that button. Nice, there we go. Work our way all the way around. I don't know if I can go around fast enough, though. Wow, such a bizarre idea. I'm just winging it, by the way. I did not practice this game or plan to play this game. I'm just figuring out as I go and seeing what happens. <laughs> Obviously, that's not good. If we keep looping around, what happens? Is there a time limit to this? <laughs> wow. All right, so if you're a, a, a puzzle, sliding puzzle aficionado, maybe you'd have some uh, good memories with locomotion. It's it's bizarre, and I, I'd give it for creativity, but, I mean, uh, <laughs> yes, right? <laughs> So everyone that is in chat, if you want to throw out some uh, some five-star ratings, I have no idea what I could do with Locomotion. If you think of all the arcade games we played at this point, would you consider this above average? Would you consider this a normal uh, game that you play in the arcade as far as enjoyability, fun, compared to everything else you could play in the arcades? I'm going to say Locomotion is uh, it, it is create creative, but uh, there's not a lot of control you have. As far as moving the train around, you're pretty much watching the train move around the tracks. So it's not, it's in the gameplay department, it's really not doing anything special. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go three stars. It's, uh, it, it, you, you could bump it higher, like three and a half, because of the, uh, doing something different. But it's not doing a lot for gameplay. It's, it's more of, it's a sliding puzzle, and you, you move a, a few things around. So there you go, there's Locomotion for in the arcades. Let's press forward and see our next game. Yes, back on the ZX Spectrum. This is Robot Missile. Let's see what Robot Missile is all about. Another one that's by Usborne Publishing, part of a type-in on the book called Computer Battle Games. So let's type it and play Robot Missile, April 23rd, 1982, by Daniel Isaman and Ginny Tyler. So type in the correct code, letter, letter A to Z, to defuse the missile. You have four chances. Wait, we just have to type in a code? All right, so D. Earlier than D. Uh, B. Earlier than B. Is it A? <gasps> we defused the... Oh, my, we refused the missile first. Uh, defused the missile the first time. And the game's crashed. <laughs> Every single one of these ones, they just crash whenever you finish the game. That's it. After you type it in, it plays it one time, and that's it. Oh, man, that's bad. Uh, that's really bad. That's, that is... It did break on us. I'll say half star, because that's all we did was guess what the missile was. <laughs> Oh, yes, we will be seeing that one in the future, definitely. All right, let's see our next game. The launch of the ZX Spectrum. Here it is, Touchdown on the ZX Spectrum. Another one that's part of the Type-In Games by Usborne Publishing from Computer Space Games. So let's type in and play Touchdown. April 23rd, 1982. Let's see what Daniel and Ginny have done now. <gasps> there it is. It is the slight graphic version of... It's not a Lunar Lantern. You're literally... Typing in or pushing in the numbers to thr uh, to thrust that rocket on the right side and not crash. And the rocket crashed and the game crashed. Just like all the other ones. So there you go. There's Touchdown for the ZX Spectrum. Now I feel like we're playing the launch of when we, when we played Microsoft DOS. The very first Microsoft DOS game was named Donkey. And it's it's like, wow, it's borderline a game. That's what I feel like with these. These are borderline games for the launch of the ZX Spectrum. Uh, this one is a uh, pretty, uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. I'll, I'll say one star for touchdown. I mean, these are all part of a book you could type in yourself. All right, and uh, let's go to our next game. What do we got now? Still on the ZX Spectrum, this is ZX Nightmare Park. We've seen this on the ZX81. It was Nightmare Park, but now it's the version for the ZX Spectrum. Let's take a look at the box. We actually have a box, Nightmare Park. Scary Bread Hill software, it looks like, for the front of this one. That's all we get for the front of the box. And then just two possible versions. Let's pop in the cassette tape and play ZX Nightmare Park. 
on April 23rd, 1982, published by Bread Hill Software. This is by JDS Cranston. Way to go, JDS. Welcome to ZX Nightmare Park. You must make your way through the park from S to F, start to finish. Remember, the shortest route may not be the best. Stay on... Oh, okay, I couldn't finish. They already went to the next screen. Okay, so which direction do we want to go? North, south, or east? It won't let us go back west. We try to get to the other side. This is the same game we played on the ZX81. So we go east. It's going to have a random event. You must guess the number I have chosen. It lies between 29 and 57. You're allowed six attempts. Okay... You have six tries. I have to guess the number. What is it? Five? Five's too low. Oh, well, way too low. Let's do 45. 45's too low. 65. 65's too high. 60. 60's too high. So you can see this game is letting you... Oh, here. Let me just pick a wrong guess. Every time you play Nightmare Park, it randomly plays something. Failure! The number was 46. Of course, we had to guess the prepare to meet thy maker. Oh, and they added the beeper. There was no sound on the ZX81. ZX Nightmare Park claims another victim. But dare you try again? Yes, we will. Ha! You haven't got a chance. No, you have not. It is so random. So we go back to the beginning. We go east. See, we didn't have the same random event. We go east again. Has another one that's random. The Gruesome Gambler. He challenged you to throw a higher or lower dice roll. Unfortunately, he won't say which after you throw. Your life is at stake. He throws 5 and 5 and 10. Will you try for a higher or lower score? Let's do lower. You throw 2 and 2. Yes, we did it. We rolled 4. The bet was that he would score more. Ha ha. You lose. Oh, Good day, sir. Every time you play ZX Nightmare Park or Nightmare Park, it's always going to have a something random that happens. Do you dare try again? No, we do not. You've made a wise decision. <laughs> it is quaint, though. I do like the idea. While it is all random, having different events come to the, the, the side, <laughs> I, I, I do in, enjoy it. So I'm going to save all the games you could play. It's going to be about, about average for the time. So three stars, I'll say, for ZX Nightmare Park. Well, maybe subpar... Yeah, at this point, we'll say subpar, two and a half stars, somewhere around that that, that range, because it is it is random, but it is fun to play, because every time you, you check it out, it's going to be a different experience. And what else are you going to play after the launch of the ZX Spectrum, right? All right, so there we go. We got to put our video game playing on pause this evening. Lots more to play and, and check out in 1982. We haven't even scratched the surface of all the games in 1982. The bulk of the games released in 1982 happened around November and December. So get ready for those. In the meantime, that's all we have for today. Like I always say, video games in the United Kingdom plus time equals Ubisoft. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.